this morning. In your New Testament scriptures, third gospel, Luke chapter 14. I want to read verses 25 through 35 for our consideration this morning. So Luke chapter 14. Begin the reading at verse 25. Hear now God's word. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me. Father in heaven, again, we do come to you because we seek your help. And Lord Jesus, we call on you as the exalted Lord, the mediator between God and humans and spirit of God, we ask for your help to understand. You're the teacher. You're the one who brings to our mind uh, what Christ teaches and shows us beautiful things out of the word. So try in God this morning. Make this time profitable. And again, your, your word is present from beginning to end in the time of worship. May, may this part also then be profitable to shape us into your image. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's passage comes from a section in Luke where Jesus is journeying towards Jerusalem. So last week, if you remember, we saw Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration where Moses and Elijah appeared and they spoke to Jesus about his upcoming departure, something that would happen in Jerusalem. Well, when Jesus comes down off that mountain after that experience, we read, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Luke is funneling our attention to this focus on the cross, this departure that will take place at Jerusalem, a resurrection and ascension, and as Luke shows us in his next book, the book of Acts, an outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Well, that's, that's Jesus' mission, bringing about that salvation is what he is all about. And so here in Luke 9, you, you have this turning point in the gospel where Jesus sets his face to Jerusalem to do that. And for the next 10 chapters, Luke just wants us to see Jesus moving towards Jerusalem. And as he makes that journey, large crowds attach themselves to him. And it, it doesn't seem that it's merely crowds coming out of the villages to see him passing through. Some of these people are following him to the next village, forming almost an entourage, if you will, wanting to see what will happen when he gets to Jerusalem. And why would they do that? Don't they have jobs? Don't they have families? Well, there's messianic fervor in the air. I want you to keep in mind, in their history, less than 200 years before the time of Jesus, Israel had liberated themselves from the Greeks. One of their own, Judas Maccabeus, had led a movement of revolution, and they had thrown off the Greek oppressors for a time. And they had reclaimed some of their lost land. The borders of Israel got back to the point they were during Solomon's time. 
But then the Jewish ruling party became corrupt. There was war between rival parties trying to seize control. And in 63 BC, Rome came in and established themselves as the dominant power. And Rome wasn't really interesting in settling a dispute. They were just growing their own kingdom, and here was another stop on the way. So those events were not far from people's minds, grandparents or great-grandparents or maybe more than that, but, but the stories had been passed down. It wasn't that far in their past. This people had known liberty, and they were ready to experience liberty again. And when Jesus appears, he looks like the kind of person who might be able to liberate a nation. Maybe he's going to go to Jerusalem and establish God's kingdom. Maybe he's going to bring in the revolution. That's why they follow him, wanting to see what will happen. Well, it is true, Jesus does say that he has come to establish God's kingdom, to bring in God's reign. He's truly doing that, but... As he has explained several times, that kingdom will look very different from what people expect. And even at the very beginning, it will be shocking and different in how the kingdom of God comes. It will begin with apparent failure, with the shameful death of Jesus on the cross. And so he's telling these crowds that are following him, if you want to follow me, you need to be ready to participate in the true life of the kingdom. You want to go with me? You want to see me bring in the kingdom? Then let me tell you exactly what the kingdom is like and what you need to do to be a part of it. And so it's a message that all of us need to hear this morning. So let's look at this passage where Jesus gives us his conditions for disciples. You see, if if we know what Jesus requires, if we're reading the fine print, so to speak, what are we signing up for in being Christians? Well, if we know that at the front, we can be prepared to follow him wherever he leads. So let's look at these conditions today. And in in terms of an outline, I, I begin right there. Two conditions for disciples. We have them in verses 26 and 27. Both of these end with the words, cannot be my disciple. So they're, they're phrased in the negative. If, if a person does not do what Jesus says here, they cannot be his disciple. And, and just as an aside, based on maybe you've heard this uh, in your life, the, the call to discipleship is the call to salvation. So maybe you've heard that differently in preaching before, as if Jesus first calls us to be saved by faith, and then later he calls us to follow him as disciples. I, I would suggest the Bible puts those together as, as one package, one verse just to help make that point from Luke 9. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me, language of discipleship. The very next sentence reads, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Salvation language put right together with discipleship language. So what are the conditions for discipleship, for salvation, for following Jesus? So the first is in verse 26. If anyone comes to me, And does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, if you're familiar with the message of the Bible, this this condition probably sounds a little odd, doesn't it? I mean, are not Christians, should they not be people of love? Did not Jesus say the greatest commandment in Scripture is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Or even think about it from this perspective. If someone is not a Christian and they're following the ways of the world we read in Ephesians 2, do you have to tell them to be hateful? No, seems like that would come pretty naturally, right? So how is that a condition for discipleship? Now, I think it helps to try to get under the surface. What's generating this command? Of our Lord. When we read commands, is Jesus just giving us an arbitrary list? He could, because he's king. But, but what's underneath them? What generates these commands? Well, let's think for a minute 
about the mindset towards family in Jesus' day. His culture placed a high value on the family network and was much more corporate than you and I are used to in our modern world. We're much more individualistic. In Jesus' day, it was much more corporate. You might live with your family your whole life, not as a freeloader, just you live together in the same area, possibly even doing the same job. So Joseph was a carpenter. Jesus was the carpenter's son. It was expected that he would end up being a carpenter like him. So if someone shows up and says, hey, you need to follow me. I I have new priorities for you. You need to put my priorities first. What if the family as a whole isn't interested in that? That could alienate you from your family if you choose to follow that call. And being small towns, small villages, it would be a social scandal. Should you respond to Jesus' call, and maybe you're the only one. So there's enormous social pressure against doing anything that disrupts family ties. So when I say all that to say when Jesus calls his disciples to hate their families, I don't think he's telling us, all right, this is the mood, or this is how you should feel about your family. I want you to feel animus towards them. I want you to feel anger towards them. I want you to be against them. No, he's saying don't let them have primary allegiance. Nothing, family included, which is the very live issue, nothing though should keep someone from following the ultimate, the primary, the most important call when Jesus calls someone to follow him. It's like building a house. If you're going to lay a foundation, that goes in first. And all the other parts of the foundation and the walls to come are are oriented to that. You've got to get the foundation right so the rest isn't crooked. Your love for Christ should be the fixed point in your life. It will be your anchor. And then everything else gets oriented around that. So that is what Jesus is calling us to do in following him. I think we could even go a little, a little deeper and ask, hey, what's the principle here? I think Jesus is putting his finger on the idea that all humans, any society, any place, any time, we crave safety, don't we? We crave security. We want to know where our provisions are coming from. And family is something that provides that. And that's not bad. Families are supposed to do that, right? But ultimately, if we are creatures made in God's image, where does our ultimate safety come? Where does our ultimate security come? It comes in him. And therefore, to be rightly related to God, to be oriented towards him, is the first priority we have in our life. And in fact, if if you ask your family to provide that, if you expect that they'll provide all the security, all the safety, all the satisfaction, well, that's a burden they can't bear. And it leads you to misuse them. That's not how God wants his creation to run. The good news then is when Jesus gives this command, he is saying, if you listen to me, you'll find a new identity in me. And it won't be based on your family. It won't be based on your social status. It won't be based on your background or where you come from or anything else. It will be based on me. So, when, so you might lose something, possibly, but you will gain the love of Christ. You will gain God, and you will have the love of one you can't live without and whose love you can never, use to, never lose, to quote Tim Keller. And then you'll even be better able to love others that God calls you to love. And so I think, I'm, I think I'm making that point clear of what Jesus is calling us to do, not what he's calling us uh, not to do. I'll give this warning just in case, because I've seen this at, at different places uh, in my life. Christ is by no means giving us the right to ignore or to mistreat our families in the name of religion. It's interesting that Paul goes on to say, here's how a Christian home will operate. Here's how a dad will operate. Here's how a mom will operate. Here's how children will live in their home. Christians ought to be at least great spouses, great parents, great children. So so Jesus is not saying, okay, yeah, you ignore them, you mistreat them because you've got to do this stuff for the church or in the name of religion. That's not the point. He's going after ultimate loves, ultimate priorities. In fact, I think we can prove that because what's the last item in the list of people you have to hate? You have to hate yourself. Again, is Jesus saying, hey, be nasty to yourself. Loathe yourself. No, he's just saying, 
even you cannot be the highest priority in your life. Only Christ can be the number one priority who provides true safety, true security, true acceptance, and is thus worth following. So that's the first condition, and I think we can treat the second quickly because it's in the same vein. It's in verse 27. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So again, notice that word carry or phrase, carry their cross. That's where Jesus is pushing against what the crowd expects. I'm not headed towards military victory, he tells them. My mission, in fact, will look like a total failure because I'm going to be crucified in Jerusalem. I'm going to be up there with two criminals, and it's possible that the word that describes Barabbas and those that set free, and then those who are crucified with Jesus, sometimes translated thieves or criminals, it could be also translated as revolutionaries. So here are people that were captured for trying to revolt. Jesus is along with them. Rome says, we kill all of them. It's going to look like a total failure. And so the message for disciples is you've got to be ready to go down a similar path should it so lead. That you would follow Jesus, even if it looks like failure or foolishness, to those around you. In fact, when Jesus says, carry your cross, we we see this in the Gospels, don't we? Prisoners frequently, in Jesus' day, made to carry their own cross to the place of execution. So one writer describes it like this. Disciples will live as though they were condemned to death by crucifixion which means they are oblivious to the pursuit of noble status. They find no interest in one's future. They don't stockpile possessions. They are free to identify with Jesus and his dishonorable suffering. And again, you ask, okay, well, so I can't make college plans. I can't can't have a savings account. How does this work? Again, I would view it as a call to fix one's attention on what is ultimate and eternal. I don't think Jesus is speaking absolutely where, okay, any desire you have, any ambition you have for your life, well, that's sinful. Any possession you have for your life is sinful. What he's saying is, where's the first investment? What gets first place? Are we cultivating eternal virtues? Are we investing in the life to come? Are we becoming now the kind of people who will live in God's new creation? In order to do that, sometimes you've got to get rid of some things, sometimes a lot of things. And that's the call that Jesus is issuing here. I would even try to spin it positively. Jesus is telling you there's no better freedom in life than to be free from the love of one's own life. When you love your possessions, when you worry about them, that's a choking slavery. It kills true and lasting joy. And so Jesus is saying invest in the eternal And there will be eternal rewards. So those are the two conditions. Now, here's what Jesus does in the next verses. He illustrates for us what it will look like if we meet the conditions, if we follow him. So now we have two illustrations and a summarizing condition. So two parables here, and they're pretty easy to follow, at least in their main details. So here's the first story. A man wants to build a tower. This could be a vineyard tower, like like a farm tower, or it could be some kind of defensive tower in a city. He should calculate whether he has enough funds to complete the venture. And in the second city, or excuse me, a second story, a king is about to go to war. He should calculate if he has enough troops to win the conflict. So both stories, you have a person with a task in front of them, they need to estimate at the beginning if they have what it will take to complete the task. Now, let me tell you how I've always read these parables, and it may land with you as well. It sounds like Jesus is saying, take a long look at yourselves. Do you have what it takes to follow me? That is, do you have enough commitment to follow me. And coming out of what he just said, it's easy to go that direction. But I don't think that's the main point. Because what does Jesus want the two people in the parables to do? He doesn't want them to undertake the task. The person in the tower shouldn't build 
and the person going to war should sue for peace. In other words, both people should realize before they start, I don't have what it takes. My resources are insufficient. Let me try to show you that. Follow follow me here. In the first story, the builder has enough money to lay the foundation, but the possibility exists that he doesn't have enough money to finish the tower. He should realize that before he starts, lest everyone mock him when he runs out of money and can't finish. He should not try to build the tower. And in the second story, I think this one is even clearer, the king does not have enough troops to defeat the opposing king. He only has half the troops. So what should he do? Sue for peace. Don't go to war because you don't have enough troops to win. You need to take an alternative action. So how should we hear Jesus' words here? What is he saying? Because we're, we're probably thinking, I don't want to be like the guy who didn't have enough money. I don't want to be like the king who didn't have enough troops. But Jesus is telling us this. You are the guy without enough money. You are the king without enough troops. He doesn't tell them in the parables, get more money, get more troops. He tells them the opposite. So here's how I think it connects to the calls to discipleship. Jesus is telling them, so many of you are tied to family approval. So many of you are tied to what you can have in this life. So many of you are following me because you think it liberates you from Roman rule. You're just following me because you can get out of it for this life. And if you go down that path, you will be disappointed. If you try to follow me with those expectations, if you try to follow me with those ties, you won't make it. And so Jesus wants them to realize if they keep following him in that way, they won't be able to finish. They can't make it on those resources. So Jesus is saying right now, while you're following, before we get to Jerusalem, before we go to the next town, take alternative action. And I don't think he's saying go home. I think he's telling them change your priorities. Put me at the center of everything. Depend on me and be ready to follow me no matter what, not for what you get out of it, but because of God's kingdom and reign, because of what he values. You follow me that way and it will be worth it. You can't follow me with your current entanglements. You have to change course. But if you follow me in the way I'm calling you to, it will benefit you. And I think we see that in that summarizing conclusion or condition in verse 33. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. See, what what response should we make to the parables? We should give something up. We shouldn't try to muster up more commitment. We should give up what we have. And some translations render this as possessions. You have to get rid of all your possessions. I think that's too specific. Jesus is vague or general on purpose. Give up everything you have, every ultimate attachment, everything you depend on, every source of security, every entangling uh, possession, every wrong motive for following me, give it up. You don't need it. And then you can follow me. So it gives us a chance just to ask ourselves some questions. You know, what do I trust to get me through life? What do I trust for eternal life? What what story am I telling myself or are others telling me about what I need to make it in my life? What do I think I have to have? Is it money and possessions and popularity? Or is it power and pleasure? Is it what our friends or our coworkers say, hey, this is the good life? Or is it what the Bible says, this is what God's kingdom looks like? This is what my kingdom citizens look like? And is that the path we want to follow? Because I can assure you, your own resources are limited. But what Jesus gives is unlimited. And so the story closes today, the passage concludes, with an invitation to follow in verse 34. It doesn't sound like an invitation at first, but that's what it is. Verse 34, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? 
It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. So salt has value. Salt has a purpose. It's a seasoning, as we all know. In Jesus' day, it could have been used as a fertilizer. That that may even have a role still uh, in our day. But if the salt loses its saltiness, it's worthless. Now, at this point, you wonder, how does salt lose its saltiness? Well, Jesus may be playing on the idea that salt doesn't lose its saltiness. I mean, I suppose there's maybe some way to dissolve it where it loses its saltiness. But salt normally doesn't lose saltiness. And so Jesus is comparing that to discipleship. Just as true salt cannot lose its saltiness, true disciples can't follow Jesus without radically realigning their priorities and loves. And if they try to follow him without doing that, this is where Jesus gets blunt, that is worthless. So Jesus is saying, follow me. But if you follow me with all those entanglements, it's not going to get you anywhere. Give it all up and follow me. And I would just conclude with good news. If that's the path you want to follow, if there's something that the Spirit of God stirs in your soul to say, yes, That is exactly what I want for my life. Know that Jesus has already walked the path for you. It's not a call to be tough enough. It's a call to give it all up and trust in him alone. He walked that path in dependence on his heavenly father. He gave up everything. He literally, physically took up the cross and was crucified. And God raised him from the dead and exalted him into heaven and has poured out his spirit so that you can know eternal life, so that you can know there's joy in that path, that there's power from God in that path, that that path leads to a good end. The resources are there. They're just not in here. They're with God. And so follow that path today. Jesus is offering us much better than we can ever imagine, more safety, more security, more joy. So go in that path at that narrow gate. Give everything up but follow him down the path that leads to life. And let's pray for God to give us uh, the ability to do that as the story ends. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So let's pray. Father, we pray in accordance with what your son said, with Lord Jesus, what you call us to do, to have ears to hear in order to hear. So help us. Help us to hear your voice today in the scriptures. And show us especially what following you would look like in our context. That's where we want wisdom. We, we want to know how to take commands like this, Lord, and, and live them out in our, our daily lives. When we go home today, when we go to work or school or tomorrow, help us to know what this path looks like in our lives. Give us that wisdom and make it beautiful to our eyes. Make it attractive. Change our hearts to want that and to stay on that path and to trust you to carry us down. And would you do good things in our lives, in our church, we pray, in our communities because of that. Would you give us all the grace and mercy we need? Forgive us when we walk poorly, but thank you for your forgiveness, your mercy, and your great grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name.